By the Book on BFM 89.9. Hello, you are listening to By the Book. I'm Lee Chui Lin in the studio with me, of course, as always, my fellow book browser for life, Sharmila Ganesan. Wow, for life is a huge commitment, but I like it. I know. I I, I took a stab. <laughs> I went out on a limb and you met me there. I'm there. Thank you, Lin. Also joining us is... Um, a bit of a minor blast from the past, our very first <laughs> book clubber, Tishao Eek. Um, hello. Thank you very much for having me again. I've been waiting for this opportunity. We did notice the looks. <laughs> we can't pretend. Yes, looking longingly at the studio whenever you're in here. So, um, Xiaoyik is here because we wanted to talk about something that's pretty close to all our hearts, but Xiaoyik has like a slightly more immediate perspective on mm. this. Um, and that is, we tend to get questions about, um, about the book's about introducing books to kids mm. because we talk a lot about our we formative books. We talk a books. lot about the books that we read as children. And surely do I hear you. <laughs> um, so we, we tend to talk a lot about that and people have asked. So we thought we would just kind of um, focus a whole show around the notion of introducing children to reading. And uh, Xiaoyi has the experience of both being a childhood reader and mm -hmm. now reading to a child, Declan. Yes. Her child, Declan. A <laughs> child. Not just any child. A child can... that she names Declan every night. <laughs> Uh, yes. A topic also very close to my heart um, because it I think it was one of the the several conscious decisions that my husband and I made uh, when we knew we were going to have a kid that reading is going to be something we really want to nurture in our son. Well, it's interesting that you say the conscious decision, right? Mm -hmm. Because one of the things I get asked a lot by parents, I'm not a parent myself. Neither am I. Um, I get asked by a lot of my friends who are parents, oh, how do you get... How, did, how can I get my kids to read? Or oh, you read so much, you read so much as a kid. How do I get, get that to happen? And while I don't have an easy answer, it strikes me that it's not something that will happen on its own. Mm, no, absolutely. Um, no, books are not the most immediate form of entertainment, are they? I mean, let's mm, face it. Yeah, especially in this day and age when there's so much more um, instant uh, and more, uh, what do you, just look at what kids can get through TV and through their gadgets, right? In a way, uh, there's, uh, it's, it could be said that that stuff is a lot more entertaining, the videos and the games and all that. And so to decide that reading is the main form of entertainment you choose for your child is, is almost to take a step back from everything that's easier to give to them. Mm. And, um, there, there were a lot of strategic um, decisions that went into what kind of uh, books we wanted him to read at every stage or be exposed to at every stage and how we wanted to introduce that. So I've, um, again, not a parent, but I have outed my parents as non-readers um, on this show before. Ooh. Yep, no, because they aren't. Mm. I mean, my, my mom uh, would sometimes read, uh, her tastes ran very much towards uh, the Jackie Collins and Sydney Sheldon's mm -hmm. um, The Bestseller List, which is great, but she didn't read that much. Mm -hmm. um, my father, on the other hand, very proudly talks about how he has never read a book a day in his life. Just you know, <laughs> like when I meet your dad properly, that's the thing that's going to stick in my head. Hi, uncle. You, I heard you've never read a book a day in your life. And he'll probably have a newspaper near him because that's his favorite form of reading. That's his main one. Uh, he describes it as I like to turn the paper. He doesn't even describe it as reading. Reading. Yes. So the I like to turn the paper and let the words jump out at me <laughs> briefly. So the yeah. So neither of them um, were necessarily strategic you know, introduces in that way, mm. I think. But um, they were both very, I don't, they they read to me a lot. My father in particular did the voices, uh, read to me oh, every wow. single night, mm. um, which is interesting for a non-reader himself. Mm. So I think it's some, it, it's it's how, it's how you think about it, I suppose. M my parents, you know, not finding necessarily that much pleasure in books themselves, nevertheless mm. um, wanted their kid to become a reader. And so it's just an interesting thing to hear you say that as well. Mm. I think the, Opposite almost is true for me. Well, in some ways, at least, because I grew up around books. Um, my there, there were always bookshelves in my house. We lived with my grandparents when I was growing up. My grandfathers on both sides read voraciously, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether novels or Reader's Digest. They were just always around. Mm -hmm. um, so it didn't feel unnatural that the moment I could pick one up, that I that I would. And my mom read to me every night as well. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know, it was a sort of a meeting of both a conscious effort and as well as just it being so normal that not reading felt odd. And I think it's not a it's not a coincidence that as my grandparents passed on and and that sort of diminished a little bit, um, that not all of my younger 
Uh, even like my brother, who's the youngest in the family, he's not as much of a reader. My other uh, cousins who didn't grow up that way aren't necessarily readers themselves. So I think it, it has some correlation there. Yeah, and for me, my strongest uh, childhood memories uh, actually revolve around reading with my parents. Mm. Um, uh, sitting on my mom's lap and reading Lady Bird. Uh, you know, I think all of us have that same memory, probably the the Peter and Jane, that series. Um, and I don't remember how old I was, but she things she probably started me as young as uh, the age of three uh, and the other memory with my father is um, going to a department store with him picking out our first Init Blyton book together oh I feel like we all had such similar experiences <laughs> The Magic Faraway Tree by Enid Blyton Once upon a time there were three children the eldest Joe and his sisters Beth and little Franny they lived with their mother and father in a little cottage deep in the country. They had to help their parents both in the house and in the garden, as there was lots to do. Now, one day their mother had a letter. She didn't very often have letters, so the children wondered what it was about. Listen, she said, this is something quite exciting for you. Your cousin Rick is coming to stay with us. Oh, said all the children, pleased. You know what? I was thinking we'd do this later, but perhaps this is as good a time as any. Uh, because let's take Enid Blyton as an example, right? So not unproblematic now. Um, you know, yes. when we read her, um, I assume when we were kids, like if she talked about circus folk, <laughs> you yes. know, we, we just we just rolled with it. Yeah. Um, and if she talked about you know, the famed gollywog, mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, at most you wonder, oh, what is that? Oh, the illustration's there. That's a gollywog. Mm -hmm. And then you move on. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, now we know that uh, Enid Blyton, maybe not the pleasantest person, um, and also perhaps a little bit classist, mm -hmm. um, perhaps, you know, some... In a very white centric, uh, that yeah, exactly. skewed uh, towards that view of the world. Exactly. And so I, I wonder whether we feel, whether that is something that, whether that's an issue, because I think we've talked about this before, about reintroducing fairy tales, um, you know, and just looking at it from that point of view. Are there, are there issues, I suppose, in terms of introducing these stories, which we now know to have their problems to kids, you know, in a modern setting? Hmm. I, I think that it needs... Um a little bit more nuance as you read it now, uh, whether it's to your child or with your child. Um, I mean, we all read that and we didn't grow up, um, you know, calling people gollywogs oh God. and um, <laughs> uh, thinking that circus life is um, <laughs> full of fun and games. Uh, and so... I think it's not one reading of a book that, that shapes your view um, per se. But um, when I reread Annette Blyton's Now and uh, those uh, Ladybird series that I was talking about and when they talk about, for instance, playing cowboys and Indians, uh, I do... Uh, find myself making the effort to explain to my son uh, or even um, every time uh, Peter and Jane are introduced, Peter's always playing with a ball and Jane's always playing with a doll. Yes. Um, and I just try to uh, veer off a little bit on a tangent and I'll be like, you know, um, maybe Jane would like to play with some toy cars and aeroplanes as well. Um, and just try to introduce it as a tangent to the story rather than, um, you know, a social cultural lecture. Mm. <laughs> doesn't it make a difference though when they still can't read? No, because when, when your child doesn't necess isn't necessarily able to read independently mm -hmm. um, and you you really are the book, you know, for, for better or for worse, because really they're looking at words and they're looking at the illustrations, but you can really tell yes. whatever story you want to tell. Um, however, I think once independent reading begins, and mm. um, which is where the Enid Blyton stuff really kicks in, actually. Um, I think the conversations there necessarily change because they are going to go off for an hour or two or whatever and then come back and go, oh, 
This mm. is, you, you know, I, I think just the way you understand a story is different when you're being read to and when you read alone. That's true. But I also think that that's why it is important. Um, while I don't expect parents to read every book that their child reads, especially as they grow up and, you know, yeah. time and all that, I think it's important to kind of know what it is they're reading, at least for a few of those formative years and to have some sense and to have conversations about it. So even if you may not read it, to get your child to talk to you about those books and to discuss what's in them mm -hmm. um, can can actually go a long way and that's what it means to make it an active process mm -hmm. rather than just something you impose on someone. Yeah. And I mean, speaking of um, sort of slightly older independent readers, um, the Geronimo Stilton series, for instance. A mysterious yellow envelope. Early one morning, I got up and ate breakfast. Another day, another cheese Danish, I said to myself. Then I ran to the subway. I didn't want to be late for work. Oops, I almost forgot to introduce myself. My name is Stilton, Geronimo Stilton. I run the most popular newspaper on Mouse Island. It's called the Rodents Gazette. A friend of mine said she stopped her son from reading them because she felt that um, it wasn't bringing that much value um, to him and it was introducing him to a way of communicating that she didn't like. And of course, this is a decision that you know every family, every parent is going to make uh, on their own. Um, it, she she just didn't like what he was picking up, the kind of slang and um, words that she didn't feel w were proper, I guess, uh, is the best way I can think of putting it. And and so, you know, yes, they're, they're going to be introduced to stuff uh, from their friends uh, and, um, and everything else, but always that back and forth, right? Uh, and knowing um, what they're um, getting into. We're speaking today about introducing books to kids um, and also our own introductions to reading um, and how, I guess, in some ways that has formed <laughs> us into the readers and people we are today. If you have any thoughts or questions that you'd like to throw up um, and actually suggestions as well for how you have been introducing your children to reading, WhatsApp us at 018-789-8899. You can also tweet us at BFM Radio and write to us at bythebook at bfm.my. Brainy, fancy material. BFM 89.9. Hello, you are listening to Buy the Book with Lynn Sharmila and today Xiao Ik. Uh, we are talking about children and reading because um, every time we, we witter on about little women, <laughs> <laughs> um, we get a question about whether or not we think it's appropriate to introduce to kids. And I think um, that is the next thing, right? Like, So we were talking about uh, in at Blyton earlier and I think I wanted to ask you something Shawi about how you said with uh, with your son Declan um, you it's a very strategic sort of mm. thing a decision I that like you've made I like that word yeah. strategic yeah. I think it's important it makes me sound a little bit um, overly controlling but <laughs> no I think <laughs> you sound smart and driven that's what it does. I think like <laughs> determined to raise a reader yes. which mm. which I can fully get behind <laughs> um, so when it comes to appropriateness, mm. right, and uh, exposure. I think that's something that a lot of people worry about and that's why we always have, um, whenever it's whenever we're talking about screens and what we watch, then there's parental guidance, there's parental controls, but books are different because really, so long as you leave them on a shelf low enough, someone right. can get like, to it. Like we've confessed many times that mm. we both started reading Stephen King much too young and it traumatised us. The Godfather, way yes. too young. Did um, not know yes. that much about adult interaction. Disclosure, yes. way too young. Yes, yeah. I, that's the thing. So, I, I'd oh, like disclosure. Yes, oh. I know. I didn't even know what was being described and then I was horrified. Okay. Yeah. It's really, yeah. <laughs> For me, so, it was um, it. It was mine as well. Yeah. Yeah. It was it me was at 12. Um, so clearly everyone's just reading. It's because school libraries had them, weirdly. <laughs> Again, at shelves, think about shelf heights, people. Yeah. Like you know, it's <laughs> Another conversation, libraries. Yeah. <laughs> if it's within reach. Mm. So yeah, when it comes to your strategy for, for Declan, how is that something that you're thinking about in terms of appropriateness? I mean, are you always exposing him to things slightly above so that he can kind of learn towards it? Or is mm. it, you know, at his level? Like, how do you think about that? So that that's quite a bit of trial and error as well. And um, most of the mistakes I, I think um, I made at least were um, earlier on um, where I, I think... 
I was perhaps um, being overachieving. So when in, I, I would say in the first year and a half, um, I was, you know, being the, the typical sort of tigery mom. I'm going to read him poetry, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you know, uh, children's adaptations of Charles Dickens. What? <laughs> oh, bless I mean, you, Charles! So children's <laughs> adaptations. <laughs> what was the plan here? <laughs> Graphic, you know, visualizations. Um, and then at some point, <laughs> looked at myself <laughs> and thought, "Hang on, you don't have to go so far." Um, the 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 principles, I think, are really. Um, what's telling a good story? Um, the 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 illustrations are really important, and something that you when you read, um, you as the parent can get into as well. Can you can do the voices? You find that um, the climax and the twists and turns, and and um, good children's books, no matter how simple they are, can achieve that. Mm. And so there's, there's, it's been a bit of a moving goalpost as he gets older as well. And um, he then starts to discover his own interests. And um, I try not to um, control that too much. Uh, so if it's, a, he likes certain themes, transportation, uh, for example, space travel. And so as long as he's reading, I'm happy to just get him loads of books about trucks and cars. Um, and at the end of the day, if he's spending his time um, exploring words and stories um, through that, I, I'd rather he be doing that than asking for television. Yeah. So Declan is four, right? Yes. Um, how important is it, and, and you know, whether from the start or along the way, how important is it that kids see their parents also reading and also enjoying reading because I personally think that that's quite important because kids want to do what the adults around them do mm. um, and I often feel like if you tell your kid to read but you're not reading that it may mm. not necessarily work as well um, I'm sure it must play some part but I'll be perfectly honest um, I, I don't know if my husband and I have been sitting around the house really reading books in front of well, our son. Well, you are son. taking care of a four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I read from a Kindle. Um, and so I, I don't know if my son makes that connection uh, uh, that a tablet is the same thing as reading a book. Mm. Uh, he might just see me on a gadget. Having said that, he still loves his books. Uh, and he would sh happily choose reading a book over watching TV sometimes. And so um, there's no hard and fast rule. I, and I'm, I'm sure uh, if, you, if we are reading with a child, that's already setting an example. Yeah, because like I said, um, did not grow up in yes. a very bookish household, yeah. mm. um, but was read to a lot. So I think it, it kind of got ingrained in me that Firstly, I think reading became a comfort, right? Because it's the thing we do before we go to bed yeah. and then it's associated with uh, good memories. It's associated with a feeling of like of pleasure. You know, it's something In you bonding, like to do. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and so even though after that growing up, I didn't see, you know, beyond the, the turning of the newspaper, I, I didn't see that much other reading happening in my house. Nevertheless, my parents were always, um, up to a point, willing book suppliers. So I think the mm. relationship then became a little bit more um, transactional in that sense when it came to reading, where I'm like, okay, when's the next time we're going to rent books? When is the next time I'm going to get to go oh, to a bookshop? Book bookshop? rentals. Book yes. rentals. And negotiating the number of books I would get to rent yes. because uh, they just did not understand how quickly some books finish. Yes. <laughs> so, so that became a little bit of a, of a thing. But it continued to be a bond. You know, like uh, our weekend, especially during school holidays, you know, the first thing I wanted to do at the start of a school holiday is to make my way to Novel House in SS2. <gasps> oh my gosh! Novel House is yes. the best! <laughs> Oh, you guys are all Tsalango people. I yeah. used to go to Bangsa Book Rental. Oh, oh yes. I remember Bangsa Book Rental as well. I do not. I will not acknowledge it. <laughs> but um, a novel house was a place of joy, wasn't it? It's the best. You it know, is. and it was really so that was the first thing. And then subsequently it was like, okay, how often in in this school holiday are we going to get to go? You know, because so I, I agree that like seeing your parents read super mm. important, but failing which I think 
continuing an encouraging relationship yes, with yes, your child absolutely. about yeah. reading, mm-hmm. that's yeah. more than anything. And I, I'll add one more, if you don't mind, to that, um, the, the, the list of activities revolving around reading. Um, visiting secondhand bookstores in mm. Penang, uh, because we used to spend a lot of our school holidays in Penang. And it was, again, another vivid memory. Um, my sister uh, and I, with my with our mom, sitting in a trishore. Uh, visiting uh, the secondhand bookstores and coming what back a with sweet memory that is, you know, coming <laughs> back with um, bag loads, which I really think our parents indulged us a lot in. I'm very thankful for, and I started doing that with Declan um, when I went to Penang recently and went book hunting. I think the one thing I rem- realize now as I think back, my parents would punish me or say no or whatever about a lot of things, no going out or no phone calls or. They had never, ever said, I won't buy you a book. Mm. Um, you know, every reward, uh, every sense of something being done well, or it was it was never something that they said, don't do it or we won't do it. And I think that also helped because it was viewed as something that was just really good for you um, and not in a medicine is good for you kind of way, but mm. in a we see why you take joy in this and we see why it's important. Mm. Now, I asked that question just now about appropriateness because I have long mulled this over. Um, I think my parents left me a sex ed book on purpose, like like, it, <laughs> and it wasn't and it wasn't a book that was meant for me. It was a book that was about that was meant for parents to tell them how to teach their children mm. about growing up. Um, and instead, it was just left out there one day, and and <laughs> and I think they knew because you know they wouldn't so have they, just they read it and they're like. I don't think I can do this, but you know what? This will do the job. She'll for read it. it. Yeah, exactly. So I have a theory that they just left it out and, and expected me to find it, which I did. And I read it and I was like, oh, menstruation. <laughs> now I know. So I think, yeah. So just, just to say, shall we, that, you know, reading can play many roles <laughs> in a child's life. And if we start them able to read independently earlier... They can do the difficult stuff on their own. <laughs> you know, in some cases, like I, I seem to have turned out with, you know, minor but otherwise little to no confusion. <laughs> so, so I think it's well fine. done. Thank I you. I must hunt up that sex ed book. Oh, man. <laughs> they Possibly had illustrations. New edition. Yes. Yes. Um, if you have any thoughts, suggestions, experiences, either as a child who was um, a voracious reader yourself or as somebody trying to inculcate a reading habit in their kid, let us know. We want to hear from you. You can WhatsApp us at 018-789-8899, tweet us at BFM Radio, and write to us at bythebook at bfm.my. And that brings us to footnotes. Uh, Xiaoyi is still here with us. Um, and we wanted to, I guess, talk a little bit about the formative Books. I mean, we, we circled the topic a little bit earlier. We mm-hmm. mentioned some titles, uh, but I think everybody has, and we shared some like really vivid memories of the first books that they read. And one of the ones that I think a lot of people share is Lady Bird. Absolutely. Yes. Sort of the big brand of teaching children how to read or mm. getting children to learn and how to read. And it's still popular today, um, that entire series from 1 to 12, I think, uh, and uh, which I'm starting my son on as well. Mm. I I want to know whether there is nothing better than Lady Bird, and and, and I ask <laughs> I only ask because um, I I think I am pretty sure that this is one of those things where your memory of it is so rose tinted yes. that it's really difficult to look at them objectively because you know if it's going to be your first reading experience obviously you're going to remember it as like the best but I then I also hear of you know then you also hear of like Dr Seuss and mm-hmm. just sort of other you know Shel yes. Silverstein just these sorts of other names that didn't fall within the Ladybird umbrella. And I'm like, who else is out there that I didn't know about because I was a Ladybird acolyte? So Ladybird, I think, does the double job of both being made for early readers and they did fairy tales. So they were the kinds of stories I felt like for parents, it wasn't so daunting in the sense, oh, I kind of know these stories. All I need to do is kind of, it's easier to slip into telling a story that you already know and you don't have to you don't have to l- learn a whole lot before you can do the reading together, right? Mm. Um, and that, I think, is why for a lot of people it, it played such a big part in uh, definitely Dr. Seuss and all our things that I remember fondly, but I came to them much later. 
Mm. Ladybird was mm. the one that my earliest memory of a book is probably Ladybird. I remember my copy of Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast. Once upon a time, in a town far away, there lived a rich merchant who had three pretty daughters. The youngest daughter was the prettiest of the three, and she was called Beauty. She was as good and as kind as she was lovely. Her elder sisters, although they too were pretty, were neither kind nor good. They were selfish and proud. One day, their father came home looking very unhappy. When his daughters asked him what the matter was, he replied, Alas, I'm not rich anymore. I have lost my fortune. We must all leave this beautiful house and go to live in a cottage in the country. The original non-Disney Beauty and the Beast. Um, but yeah, that's that's the oldest memory I have of a book. Mm. A, a lot of parents rely on Lady Bird to um, start the very simple reading process. Um, but actually, my son uh, learned to read on his own without Lady Bird. I actually bought them later. Mm-hmm. And really out of nostalgia, I'll admit. So... Um, Honestly, I think parents can do without Ladybird today as well because there you have a lot of other yes. options now which are more modern, are more attractive to children and don't have things like Cowboys and Indians or <laughs> Jane only playing with dolls. But that led me to wondering also about fairy tales because um, fairy tales, I think, are so hugely important for me as a reader. I mean, there's something that I return to time and time again. I've, I've returned to them as a teenager. I've returned to them as an adult. I return to them now, you know. Um, and it's both, it, it's comfort food. It's also the fact that I find new things in it because they're very old stories. And so um, even if you no longer believe in the princess and, and the tower mm. and all those different things, there are new readings that, that you can bring to it. And um, but I, I speak as somebody who's not in charge of influencing a young mind. Like, yeah. you know, I'm just... <laughs> So see, I I realize now I don't like fairy tales mm. when I read them from the perspective of um, what my son is going to take away from the story, mm. and I realize that I don't like um, that storyline. I don't like those values, and I and I'm speaking of the the um, princess being saved by the prince kind sure. of uh, narrative, not not the horrific Grimm's versions or, or and Anderson versions where everybody dies. everyone dies and horrible things happen to you everyone. Know, I'm kind of okay with those. <laughs> It's the damsel in distress ones that I can't stand. Mm. I feel like Declan might be okay with those too. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, just as a thought. Um, well, then maybe you could go back to the... Ori- because that's the thing. My, my journey through fairy tales has been, you know, you begin with the Ladybird version where it's super sanitized and um, a journey of, you know, however many pages is subtracted into a paragraph of like, and then the forest was deep and dark, but they made it. Mm. And you're like, okay, great. Um, and reading... For example, um, Little Mermaid, for the first time as a teenager, reading the original yeah. Little Mermaid for the first time, I cried. For a moment, the knife quivered in her grasp. Then she threw it far out among the waves, now rosy in the morning light, and where it fell, the water bubbled up like drops of blood. Once more she looked at the prince, with her eyes already dimmed by death, then dashed overboard and fell her body dissolving into foam. Now the sun rose from the sea, and with its kindly beams warmed the deadly coal foam, so that the little mermaid did not feel the chill of death. Firstly, I think I was disillusioned by mm. by this breaking down of the story right. that Disney had told me, Lady Bird had told me, my parents had told me. Mm. And then I'm like, oh, this was written by a very sad man and it's mm. a very sad story. Yeah. But um, that's what I mean by my love of fairy tales persisting. So I wonder whether maybe introducing the slightly safe version of the original as opposed to telling the super sanitized one and starting. Yeah, I wonder, I don't know. Kids are different now as well, right? And and parents also understand that you don't just um, read these things to them wholesale. There's also a, a, a especially with people like Shawik, parents like Shawik, who want that process to be active. Mm. Um, I think I would agree that you might do better by introducing the versions that um, the Grimm brothers or Hans Christian Andersen first intended. They were meant to be cautionary mm. stories about life anyway. Yeah, yeah, and now uh, finding the appropriate. Uh, developmental stage mm. um, to to read that together with them and 
and be able to talk about, you know, what was the idea behind that story? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Mm. Um, so tell us, what were your favourite childhood books? Is Lady Bird a big deal for you as well? You know, are you introducing them to your kids even as we speak? Um, WhatsApp us your thoughts. 018-789-8899. You can tweet us at BFM Radio and you can also write to us at buythebook at bfm.my. Shall we? Thank you very much for joining Thank us. Thank you very much. And enjoy reading to Declan. What's Declan going to be reading tonight? Um, some uh, We've picked up some books from the library that uh, we visit a lot. And uh, they've actually Who got some... It's a library anymore. I love being this... a part of your vicariously <laughs> through into your family. Can, right. can, I, can I recommend a library? Oh my God, please do. Um, there's a great one in uh, PJ uh, near Asunta Hospital. It's called Play Centre Library Association. It's run by volunteers. Uh, do check out their Facebook page and you know when you can visit because their opening hours are limited. But it's the best place because they've got classic books. They've got uh, newer stuff, um, just picture books, uh, independent readers, teenagers, everything that any child needs. Uh, and we've picked up a lot of rich Richard Scary books. Um, I, I don't know if you remember those because these are from the 80s, 70s and 80s. Uh, and they've got um, characters uh, like uh, Loli the Worm, Huckle the Cat and um, uh, great ways of introducing um, short stories um, with cute illustrations. Yeah. Excellent. A recommendation to boot. Um, <laughs> all right. So yeah, get in touch with us. Let us know what you think. You've been listening today to Buy the Book at BFM 89.9. 